Here I go. I'm going to start reading War and Peace. So you have made my day, my week, my month, my year, my life. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. It is 12 o'clock a.m. <laughs> it's April 1st. Do you guys know what that means? War and peace. That's what it means. It means war and peace. I am currently editing my Pickwick Papers vlog and I am planning on starting War and Peace tonight. I wanted to wait till 12 a.m. and it's 12 a.m. and it's time to read for this. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so excited and I'm so nervous and I am just, I am ready. I'm ready and I'm not ready all at the same time. Today has been just so busy, but I am excited to just sit down and read for a bit. Um, I'm going to finish up editing the clip that I'm working on right now, and then I think I am going to... I think I'm going to start War and Peace. Oh my god. Oh my god. I also set up a Discord. The link to the Discord will be in the description box if you guys don't know, I finally set up a Discord for Dickens and Tolstoy so we can have a little big group chat. A little big group chat. <laughs> a little big. We are going to have a big group chat all about the different books that we read for Dickens versus Tolstoy. And of course, we are going to currently be talking about War and Peace. Guys, this is a momentous day. A momentous night. I'm going to start reading. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm going to finish editing so that I can start reading because all I want to do is start reading this but I'm in the middle of editing so I'm going to finish that up and then I'm going to start, I'm going to start it, it's happening. Let me stop filming myself before reading it, and let me actually read the book. Okay. <laughs> introduction, okay. I'm gonna read the introduction. Ooh, okay. Well, this is very good. So it says, readers unfamiliar with the plot may prefer to treat the introduction as an afterword, but I am familiar with the plot, so I'm going to read the introduction first. <laughs> because I like going in with the knowledge, and I have seen the BBC miniseries from 2016, probably my favorite period piece on the face of the earth, right after Anna Karenina. <laughs> They're very different. One's a movie, one's a miniseries. So my favorite miniseries is the BBC War and Peace, but my favorite period piece movie is Anna Karenina, directed by Joe Wright. Okay. <laughs> the first line of the introduction is, here is the greatest novel ever written. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> okay, it says, Tolstoy himself saw it differently. It is not a novel, he wrote. Even less is it an epic poem, and still less an historical chronicle. Tolstoy began his project with a great joy and fear, 
and only discovered the courage of artistic freedom as part of his writing pr process. While preparing drafts of a novel about the Decembrists uprising against Tsar Nicholas I in 1825, Tolstoy became absorbed in reading the history of Napoleon and Alexander as he described it in a cloud of joy and awareness of the possibility of doing great work. The idea caught me up of writing a philosophical history of Alexander and Napoleon. All the meanness, all the phrases, all the madness, all the contradictions of the people around them and in themselves. I must write my novel and work for this. stop talking to you guys and I'm just going to concentrate and I'm just going to read and then I'll get back to you. It just took me an hour to read the 14 page introduction because I reread it and reread it and wrote all over it and highlighted and underlined and I'm literally speechless. I am speechless. There is so much that I want to say. There is so much that I want to say that is discussed in this introduction. I literally, like, wrote all over it. I wrote all over it. But that's what I want to do with this book. I want to take my time and annotate everything. And I should say... Yeah, I just went nuts. I should say that these War and Peace vlogs are going to be weekly. They're going to be like regular weekly vlogs because if I tried doing one entire vlog for War and Peace, it would be never ending. Like it would not end. So you are getting weekly vlogs of me reading War and Peace. So I hope that you guys are excited about that because that means that I can go into even more detail with every weekly vlog instead of trying to like, you know, pinpoint certain aspects and cut my chatting back and rambling back so that it fits into like one video. So yeah, I think I'm going to wait until tomorrow to talk to you guys about what I want to talk to you in regards of the introduction. It is currently 2.36 in the morning. I should probably go to bed, but now I have notes on the text and translation, a chronology of Leo Tolstoy, principal characters, and guide to pronunciation. What else? Historical characters in War and Peace, dates of principal events, Oh, we have maps. Love when a book has a map. Oh my god, and then part one. Oh my god. Another map. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I think I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to use my Tolstoy on the page postcard for my bookmark.
because, you know, momentous, momentous event. Here he is. Yeah, so I think I'm going to... <laughs> I'm just laughing at how much I've read. <laughs> Literally nothing. 14 pages out of 1,300. You know, it's alright. We'll get through it. We'll get through it. Oh my god. But it's only the introduction and I'm already blown away. Like, I haven't even read anything that Tolstoy has written and I'm already just speechless. I don't even know what to say at this point. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to go to bed. So, I will see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Good night. Now, I'm probably not going to be able to fall asleep because all I'm going to be thinking about is Tolstoy. Good thing this week is my spring break because I can just stay up and read and sleep in a little bit and just read all day. But I also have to do schoolwork. Anyway, I'm going to go to bed. Good night. Hello everyone, it is now sort of the next day, it's still April 1st, but it is almost 11pm. Today was another busy day full of university work. I just finished the introduction, contextual notes, bibliography, chronology, list of characters, and took a quick peek at the maps. And then now I am ready to actually start reading the book, but I think I want to talk to you guys a bit about um, a bit about the introduction because I find it so fascinating and since these are going to go up weekly I can go into as much detail as my heart desires. You guys feel free to skip through if you're not interested but this is what I'm so nerdy about. I love going into lots of details about the background of Tolstoy's writing and I have a fascination with names and word origin and um, and especially the Russian structuring of names is just so fascinating and they break it down to be very understandable for a non-Russian reader. I just want to talk about this with you guys. Where to begin? Oh my goodness me. Yeah, I showed you guys last night, but I annotated like a mad woman. So many, so many notes because I really want to just take my time with this book, write all over it so that I can look back and just feel that I soaked this book in. I'm not reading it just to read it, I'm reading it to absorb it. Okay, something that I found beautiful was, it's literally on the first page of the introduction, and I am also reading the Oxford World's Classics Edition. This is the Maud translation by Louise and Elmer Maud. And I just would like to thank them, because without them, I, you know, we wouldn't have this definitive translation, so. Okay, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the translation in a bit. So Tolstoy said, Tolstoy himself saw it differently. It is not a novel, he wrote. Even less is it an epic poem, and still less an historical chronicle. So he, everybody's questioning, like, this doesn't read as a novel, this doesn't read as a piece of historical text, this doesn't read as an epic poem, like what, what is this? No one knew what it was when he first read it, and I don't even think he knew what it was when he was writing it, but then he says something so beautiful, nobody would ever tell what I had to tell. Like, I love that. In before it, it says, Time and my strength were flowing away with every hour, and I knew that nobody would ever tell what I had to tell. Above all, traditions both of form and content oppressed me. I was afraid to write in a language different from that in which everybody writes. I was afraid that my writing would fall into no existing genre, neither novel, nor tale, nor epic, nor history. 
and this is from the second draft of an introduction to War and Peace. And I just, I love that they included text from Tolstoy himself kind of explaining what he thought about his own work. It also says his wife, Sofia, who served as his secretary, famously transcribed his almost illegible drafts into fair copies seven times over. Um, and then she is quoted, I spent my whole time copying out Leova's novels. This is a great delight to me. As I copy, I live through a whole world of new ideas and impressions. Nothing has such an effect upon me as his ideas and his genius. She was 18 when they married, and I think he was around 31 or 35. I mean, I would marry him. I'm 22, and he's, you know, dead for how many years? And I would, I would marry him. Is that weird? Yes, it is. Let's see. It also continues to say, Sophia says, All this winter, L has kept on writing, wrought up, the tears starting to his eyes and his heart swelling. I believe his novel is going to be wonderful. Tolstoy felt himself to be never more fit for his work. I just, oh gosh, love that. On the second page of the introduction, they quote Tolstoy again. It says, I wanted to capture everything I knew and felt about that time, and yet I felt either that it was impossible to express everything, or it seemed to me that the simple, banal literary devices common to novels were inconsistent with the majesty, deep, and many-sided content, so that I threw away what I had begun to write and despaired." So he, I, I know that there are many versions of, or there were many versions of War and Peace. He originally titled it The Year of 1812, and it went through a lot of different forms before it became what we now know of as War and Peace. Okay, this I found incredible. Um, it says, We can already glimpse the future author of War and Peace in the first paragraph of The Raid, where he writes that he is, in quotes, more interested to know in what way and under the influence of what feeling one soldier kills another than to know how the armies were arranged at Austerlitz and Borodino. So I, I think that's what I love about Tolstoy. He doesn't care about the accuracy of the battles. He wants, he wants the humanity of the battles. He wants the, the inner workings of the people that are going through this going through the event. He doesn't really... He he wants the core of it. He wants the truth. He wants the the emotion, and I just love that. Okay, this was incredible. It says, In the climate of heavy censorship in Russian letters, political ideas and pointed criti uh, critiques of the government had to be expressed cautiously, and literary fiction was one way of doing this. So, I wrote in the margins, the power of fiction, it tells the greatest truths. They can address these political critiques in a way where they can kind of get away with it and they can sort of bring attention to the bad or harmful aspects of the political day and bring light to it and bring attention to it without sort of disturbing Russian censorship. Another aspect that I loved, so they're talking about how Tolstoy writes, and it says, he writes about characters and events that are sub-historical, while the narratives of history itself, like soldiers' boastful war stories of the battlefield, are exploded as false. The movement of thousands of troops, a line on the page of a history book, will be enlarged by Tolstoy into chapters of soldierly details about boots and carriage wheels, horse manure and leg wrappings, the texture of uniform cloth, the steaming potatoes pulled from the campfire, the great and legendary figures of military history snore during the war councils or succumb with irritability to a cold, their battle plans garbled and ignored. From his earlier anxiety expressed in his diaries that his habit of digression would ruin him, Tolstoy now found artistic release and justification in unleashing it. So they're talking about the artistry behind Tolstoy and how he he gives you the minute detail. I love when they mention the texture of the uniform cloth. It adds so much life and richness and artistry. It's just magic. It's just 
incredible. I wrote in the margins, I wouldn't want it to be any other way. It also mentions, which I found very fitting, Tolstoy's artistic choices were not entirely without precedent. Hugo's Les Miserables also took its time growing to over 1,200 pages to accommodate the author's efforts to link characters across centuries and continents. Like his English contemporary Charles Dickens, Hugo also took great pains in describing the minute or minute of the daily life of characters who had only a momentary if vital role to play like the priest, okay, so they go into detail, and they were talking about Charles Dickens writing to accommodate like a word count, or I'm not sure where that part is, let me see. Some critics charged Tolstoy with the standard accusation leveled at Charles Dickens and other 19th century novelists who were considered to spin out words irresponsibly in order to fill up installments. We now know to the contrary that Tolstoy cut down his novel and discarded hundreds of pages of drafts. So I love that they brought up Charles Dickens in that way because I feel like Charles Dickens did tend to, you know, I think he was paid by the word and obviously they came from very different backgrounds. Dickens really had to provide for himself and his family and Tolstoy was born into you know, a large amount of money because he's a count. Although he did gamble away at a very young age their home and he lost a lot of his money, but I feel like it was more important for Dickens to, um, to create profit than it was for Tolstoy. I don't think Tolstoy did it for the money and I kind of feel like Dickens did it a bit more for the money which there's nothing wrong with that, you obviously have to make a living. They were also talking about how Tolstoy was a lifelong admirer of Hugo's work, as well as, I believe they mentioned that one of his favorite books was Vanity Fair by William Makepeace Thackeray, which I thought was really interesting. I have not read Vanity Fair yet. Oh, this is incredible. So a lot of War and Peace is apparently written in French because it says a lot about the political climate because of Napoleon wanting to take over Russia, as well as the, the language meaning more than just the language. So it says, French is spoken to Sonia to indicate her lower social status as a poor relation to the Rostov household, and Sonia herself speaks French only when trying and failing to be polite to her rival. I won't say who it is, for no spoilers, but I love how the, the language shows her social status and how she's lower class. Like, she's not just speaking French to speak French, it means something. Everything in Tolstoy means something. It's not just there to put it there, it has a purpose. Oof, okay, there's this one part that I really want to talk about, but it's a spoiler. So I was thinking whether I should make these vlogs spoiler free or not. I really want to go into spoilers, so I hope you guys don't mind that. I'll hold up Tolstoy every time I talk about a spoiler, and then when I put him down, you guys can listen again, so just skip ahead until I put Tolstoy down. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready for spoilers? Okay. <laughs> um, so it says, if we turn to Tolstoy's own comments about his work for guidance, we find, perhaps surprisingly, that he considered the episodes describing Anatole Karagin's seduction of Natasha to be the crux of his work. It is tempting to read these episodes allegorically, picturing this quintessentially Russian heroine as representing her homeland while her conquest by the immoral and deceptively elegant continental rake could be interpreted as symbolically describing the fall of Russia to the French. So when Anatole seduces Natasha, that's like the French seducing Russia and or trying to take over Russia. And I find that so incredible. It's genius. I love symbolism. And it also says, Natasha's defended marriage, loss of the beloved, and sufferings in love convey within her personal narrative the agony of a national tragedy. So Natasha's agony symbolizes the nation's tragedy. It could be said that Natasha's collapse under the spell of French manners and opera mirrors the events of the French invasion of Moscow. 
Her spiritual resurrection expressed most clearly when she casts aside her family's possessions to make room for the wounded soldiers on their carts parallels the self-sacrificing heroism of the Russian nation in retreat, ravaged, conquered, yet giving no quarter to the enemy. Natasha's experiences in love and marriage clearly had a meaning for Tolstoy beyond their symbolic potential. Within a few years of completing War and Peace, he would revisit the same narrative of the fallen woman in an extended, probing, and sustained way in his next great work, the first novel he credited to, to himself with Anna Karenina. So I just think that that's so fascinating. That symbolism of Natasha and the conquest and um, the defeat and the resurrection, it's just so mind-blowing. And also I love the mention of Anna Karenina. Um, there's more, but I feel like I don't want to take too much time going over this stuff. Oh, I'm done with my spoiler. I will put this down now. Okay, you can come back. There's this quote from Virginia Woolf that they included, and I think it's brilliant. It says, um, like Virginia Woolf says, if you think of the novels which seem to you great novels, you think of all sorts of things, of religion, of love, of war, of peace, of family life, of balls in country towns, of sunsets, moonrises, the immortality of the soul. There is hardly any subject of human experience that is left out of war and peace. So she's saying that war and peace is, you know, the great novel. The same monumental and comprehensively detailed quality of War and Peace has inspired characterizations of the masterpiece as the great book of life, even life itself, which I just love thinking of War and Peace as the great book of life and life itself, because that's what Tolstoy does. He captures life itself. I, I know that there's a quote, I forgot who said it, um, if the world could write itself, it would write like Tolstoy. Oh. <laughs> I could start crying. And then they include a little excerpt from A.N. Wilson's Tolstoy biography. The whole thing is brilliant, but I feel like I shouldn't babble on too long. No book seems more real. For everyone who has enjoyed the experience of being completely lost in the world's war and peace, putting down the novel and returning to the everyday concerns of real life is a turning to something paler, m less true than Tolstoy's art itself. So saying that Tolstoy's words and Tolstoy's world feels more true to life than life itself, your life itself, does to you. So, oh, it's just incredible. I definitely want to read that Tolstoy biography by A.N. Wilson, which we might possibly read. Also, the diary of his wife, Sophia. I would love to read that as well. I loved this as well. It says, as Victor Hugo observed, and then it's a quote from Victor Hugo, he who would paint a battle scene must have chaos in his paintbrush. <laughs> I love that. I love that. As a an artist myself, as an illustrator, um, whenever I paint something, I that, that made me think, that quote made me think that whenever I'm painting something that's very serene, my my paint strokes feel serene and fluid and when I'm painting something with grit and like I was even my drawings I was drawing the my author portrait of Fyodor Dostoevsky and you know Dostoevsky's a hard dark tough grim harsh gritty writer and I I felt it in my pencil when I was doing his sketch I I felt myself you know give that feeling to my work and it was just like that's exactly what Victor Hugo is saying in that sentence and I loved it. I wrote at the at the end of the introduction I have no words because I really don't. Um, okay and then this is now notes on the translation I just read this um, a little while ago and they're talking about the different translations the importance of translations and they also mentioned that they were personal, they as in Louise and Elmer Maud, who this translation is by, they were personal friends of Tolstoy and dedicated themselves to translating his work into English, as well as to writing their own accounts of his life and his ideas. Readers can uh, continue to appreciate its elegance, fidelity, and helpful apparatus, 
Biographer A.N. Wilson states that every English reader owes a vast debt to Louise and Amr Maud for their contribution to Tolstoy's scholarship. Leo Tolstoy himself asserted that better translators than Amr and Louise Maud could not be invented, and he chose to authorize Louise Maud as translator of his other story, Resurrection. And so I love that Tolstoy himself knew the mods person personally and thought that there was no there could be no better translation which i just love the fact that i because i'm i don't speak russian i wish i could i want to read tolstoy in his original form and his true form but i that i'm so thankful to louise and elmer mod for um translating it so truthfully. Then we have the chronology of Leo Tolstoy's life, which I am pretty familiar with, um, and then the principal characters and the pronunciation of how to stress certain, um, certain letters of the names. I am fascinated by the Russian naming system and how they hold so much power in Russian. I wrote in the margins, a name is so much more than just a name in Russian. They go into talking about the patronymic. The polite form of Russian address employs the first name and the patronymic, a middle name meaning son of, ovich or evich, or daughter of, ovna or ivna, so Nikolai Andreevich and Anna Mikhailovna. So the evich means son of Andre and ovna means daughter of Mikhail. The first name alone would be used only in intimate circles. And then we have diminutives, nicknames which are terms of endearment. Examples, Nikolai becomes Nikolenka, Nikolushka, where Andre becomes Andreusha, and Maria becomes Masha, as well as, um, so it says some characters are known primarily by their nickname. For example, Natasha is a diminutive of Natalia. Russian family names reflect gender, with feminine versions ending in A or AYA. So for example, Rostova or Bolokonskaya. So I just, it's just, oh, it's so incredible and fascinating how, how, you know, those names are broken down and they mean so much more than just a name. To assist the reader, they put um, the names by which the characters are known are given in capitals. The stressed syllable is marked with an acute accent. So they put an accent over whatever letter you should stress. So the Bazukovs, they put the, uh, the accent over the U, so Bazukov. And then they just go into talking about the characters and then the historical characters. So I just, I love how Dickens is very creative with his names and very fun and silly. But Tolstoy, his names mean, they have, they're multi-layered and multifaceted, And they're just, they're so complex. It's like a, it's like Russian nesting dolls. You open it up and then there's more inside and it's like never ending. It's so, it's just so fascinating. And then we have dates of principal events. I highlighted a few of them. They're minor spoilers, but not really if you're familiar with Russian history. And then we have maps. The first map is the 1805 campaign. The second map is Austerlitz. The third map is the 1807 campaign, the fourth map is the War of 1812, and then the fifth map is Borodino. So we have all the wonderful maps. And then, War and Peace, book one. Guys, I'm gonna start reading War and Peace for real now. This is a momentous, a momentous moment. I keep saying that, but it is. Ooh, we start with French. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start reading part one. Oh my gosh. The first word in English is faithful slave, which is in the middle of a bunch of French, and then it says, well, how do you do? How do you do? More French. Sit down and tell me all the news. It was in July 1805, and the speaker was the well-known Anna Pavlovna Scherer. I don't know if that, I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
maid of honor and favorite of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna. With these words, she greeted Prince Vasily, a man of high rank and importance, who was the first to arrive at her reception. Anna Pavlovna had had a cough for some days. She was, as she said, suffering from la, gri la grippe, but gripe, being then a new word in St. Petersburg used only by the elite. All her invitations, without exception, written in French and delivered by a scarlet liveried footman that morning, ran as follows. And then we have more French, but we do have footnotes with translations. Okay, okay, I'm going to stop talking now and I'm just going to soak in all the words. I do have some Russian classical music playing in the background. Obviously not right now, but when I'm reading, I am. And I'm just so excited. So, okay, here I go. I'm going to start reading more in peace. Okay, it is now 1.35 in the morning. I'm going to go to bed, but I read the first 23 pages, which is up to, it is book one, part one. I read the first four chapters, and I have a feeling that this is just going to take me a while, like even just, because um, I'm taking it in slowly because I want it, like I said, I want to absorb it. Um, so this whole time I've just been reading, but I am in love with it already. Like, it is incredible. I can't believe that this is Tolstoy's first, like, major work. Because it's just, the way that he, like, fluidly weaves the characters' interactions with one another together, and he moves from one character to another so seamlessly, and the way that he describes the characters, and... Oh my gosh, so we are three main, main, main characters. Like, the top main characters are Prince Andre, Pierre, and Natasha. We haven't been introduced to Nat Natasha yet, but we have been introduced to Andre and Pierre. And because I watched the BBC miniseries from um, 2016, I am very familiar with the, the storyline, which I like going in to hefty, daunting books, knowing the story and having that background and being able to put faces to names, even if they're side characters, it helps me a lot. I know that I'm like one of the, one of the few readers that likes to, not likes to be spoiled, but I guess doesn't mind knowing the plot before going in. It's not a spoiler. My favorite character is Andre. I just have the biggest crush on him. I also love Pierre so much, but I love Pierre as like a brother. Like I want to like hug him. These are fictional people. Um, I'm talking about them like they're real. Anyway, well they're real to me. They're real in my mind and my heart. Um, but the descriptions of when they're introduced I literally like started swooning for Andre and then like just crying for Pierre because I, I love Pierre so much. He's such a wonderful character. I feel like Andre and Pierre together make up Levin, Konstantin Dmitrievich Levin from Anna Karenina. Like they both remind me of Levin and Levin is my all-time favorite fictional character. Andre is a very close second but I'm going to talk a bit more about what I read, I think, tomorrow, just because I'm a bit sleepy. I want to get to bed um, so that I can wake up and read more, so I will talk to you guys tomorrow. I hope you're enjoying this vlog so far, and also I am annotating like a nut. I'm annotating like crazy, <laughs> and I'm loving it, so off to a fantastic start. I am adoring it. It is living up to all of my expectations and I am not surprised. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Hello everyone.
everyone! It is now Saturday, April 3rd. I didn't post an update, or I didn't film an update yesterday because I was pretty busy with my embroidery project that took up a lot of my day, but I did read my pages for War and Peace because um, we're trying to read at least 22, I think, pages a day for the 60 or 61 days for the two months, but I did read. I am absolutely loving it and now it is actually it is 1 32 in the afternoon and we are having our pickwick papers live show at two o'clock so emmett and i are going to be debating the pickwick papers and i will be on team tolstoy she'll be on team dickens and then next month for war and peace she's going to be team tolstoy i'm going to be team dickens which i love dickens but it's going to be really hard defending him <laughs> for War and Peace because I'm absolutely adoring it. I have it right behind me. Here it is. Oh, I'm loving it so much. I think I'm up to I'm up to page 51. It is chapter 12 of volume 1 or book 1 and part 1. So I am only 50 pages in, but I have so much to say about this book. I think I'm going to talk about it a little bit later because right now I'm just thinking about Pickwick Papers and I don't want to put too much War and Peace in my head right now. But I have my journal with all my notes and I have my book ready. So I am very excited for the debate. Um, Emma posted the poll on her Instagram already. I'm excited to see who you guys vote for and I just can't wait to talk about Pickwick Papers and then continue on reading War and Peace and then having the War and Peace live show. Oh my goodness, so many exciting things. But yes, okay, so I'm going to hop on the call with Emma in a few minutes. We are going to go on at 1.45, talk a little bit before the live show actually begins, and then the live show will start at two o'clock. I'm so excited, a bit nervous. Uh, Emma and I are always nervous, no matter how many live shows we do for the Dark Academics Book Club or the Dickens and Tolstoy, it's always a bit nerve-wracking putting yourself live. It's always so exciting and I love seeing all your comments while we're live, so okay, I am going to hop on the call with Emma in a bit and I will update you guys again very soon. Hey everybody, it is now Monday, April 5th. I had my class today and I have my big embroidery assignment due tomorrow, so I have been pretty busy for the early morning into the afternoon. It is now just 4 o'clock and I went to the post office because I wanted to send out a little thank you card to someone who sent me something in my P.O. box and then I have another package that I have that I got in my P.O. box and I know who this is from uh, and I'm so excited to open it so I thought I would film a little unboxing but I don't have much of an update on it's back here on War and Peace yet I am on page 61 now chapter 15 of book one part one and yesterday it was Easter and so I really didn't have much time to read and today I am back at school because last week was my spring break it's the middle of my term and so everything is just pretty busy right now for my university work so uh, yeah I don't have too much time to read I I want to all I want to do is read War and Peace but I don't have much time and you know gotta prioritize certain things so I did get a book yesterday for from the Easter Bunny um, so I'll show you guys that but I think for now I'm going to open my package this wonderful girl Christelle actually messaged me on Depop of all places and because um, like no one follows me on Depop I don't really follow anyone on Depop because I just look for used books on there because um, I love trying to you know, have secondhand books and not buy too many new books. And she messaged me saying that she had a specific edition of a book that I mentioned I wanted on my channel, and I mentioned it in one of my videos, and this is a book edition. This specific edition is currently out of print. Oh, do you hear the ice cream man? That 
that's when you know it's summer. Well, it's not summer, it's spring. There he is. Oh, it's Mr. Softy. We'll just wait for him to go by. We'll dance until he leaves. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, back to the unboxing. So this wonderful girl, Christelle, messaged me on Depop saying that she had this edition that I wanted and she was asking if I wanted it and I said, oh my gosh, yes, like how much are you charging it? And she was like, oh, I'll gift it to you for free. And I was blown away because I would, she was selling other books on her page and I didn't see it on her page. And I, I felt so bad because I wanted to compensate her for it and pay for it, but she very kindly wanted to gift it to me as a little thank you for the videos that I make and the content that I make so it was just so incredibly heartwarming and I'm very very grateful so Christelle if you're watching this thank you so 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 much oh my goodness okay um, now it's time to open it because I just can't wait anymore I am so weak Goodness! <gasps> no way! No way! Oh my gosh, she she gave me little sticky notes. I these are the exact colors I use for annotating. How weird is that? Hold on, where's a full one? Here's a full one. Oh my gosh, these are literally the same exact colors, just smaller. So these are perfect because. I didn't realize that they made small ones, but sometimes these are a bit too big, like they don't need to be so so thick. She gave me pens too. I am a stationary junkie. <gasps> a mild liner, double double ended. Oh my gosh. <gasps> oh, it's like a peachy color. Crystal, you did not have to do this. Thank you. <gasps> If I go to a stationery store or a craft store or any store that has pens, I will buy one. I have this weird... I think a lot of people do. I've, I've talked to a lot of people about this. So many people love pens. There's something about a new pen when you write with it and it's so nice and fluid and... Oh, thank you so much. I am... I will add it to my pen collection. <laughs> I not only collect books, I collect pens as well. Little did you know. <gasps> it's even more beautiful in person. Okay, okay, are you ready? <gasps> oh my gosh! Oh my god, it's the embroidered Emma cover from the Penguin Threads Editions. This is a part of the Penguin Deluxe Classics, and this, uh, series of editions, this collection, was what inspired me to make my Anne of Green Gables embroidery, which I am pretty much done with. So here is mine, and this is what inspired it. <laughs> so I have to scan in, after I'm done filming this unboxing, I'm going to scan in my embroidery, and it's due tomorrow, my embroidery project, so oh my gosh. But this is Gor gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, my hair. Hello. Look at how insanely beautiful this is. Who let a book be this gorgeous? Oh my gosh. On the back it says, one half of the world cannot understand the pleasures of the other. Oh, oh my gosh. This is so beautiful. So beautiful. I love how the inside has the opposite side of the embroidery. It's incredibly cool. And then this side looks like this. Oh my god, gorgeous. You know how I feel, if you don't know how I feel about hands, a few of you are new. Um, so hello, welcome to my channel if you're new here. <laughs> but I am in love with hands. I love, as an artist, I love painting hands, drawing hands, using hands as expressions of emotion, and this just beautiful. Oh my god, it's just gorgeous. Wow. Wow, Christelle, thank you so much. 
deckled edges, French flaps, beautiful embroidery. This is the cover design. Is The cover art is by Jillian Tamaki, who is an incredible cover designer. And I love following her. She is such, such a talented artist. Oh my gosh. Guys, one day, maybe you will be able to hold my embroidered cover in your hands. Maybe, maybe, hopefully. Oh, I wish, I wish. Thank you so much, Christelle. You have made my day, my week, my month, my year, my life. <laughs> I have wanted this edition for so long and it's out of print. Why is it out of print? I feel like everybody would buy this still. It's gorgeous, especially with the new Emma adaptation, which came out last year. It's just so beautiful. Oh my god. I can't wait to add her to my collection. Yay. So I just want to say thank you so much, Christelle, for gifting this to me. It means the entire world, the absolute entire world to me that you that you wanted to gift it to me. So thank you so, 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 so much. I just can't believe how incredibly kind you all are. Like the messages that you send me, the comments that you leave, um, and the fact that some of you guys have gifted me books and some lovely things in my P.O. box means more than I, really more than I can say, and I just, I just can't believe you guys, honestly. Um, when I started this channel, I did not expect, I did not expect this, so thank you so much. Um, I will show you guys the book that I got from the Easter Bunny yesterday. Also, I just can't believe that she gave me pens, the little tabs, which are the exact colors that I use. That's incredible. I said in my vlog, my March my March vlog that I was reading Don Quixote and I finished Don Quixote and every year for Easter my parents get me a book and they always have me pick it out and this year I picked out the cloth bound of Don Quixote because I fell absolutely head over heels in love with the story of Don Quixote and the musical Man of La Mancha which is based off of Miguel de Cervantes writing Don Quixote and the story of Don Quixote. Every time I love a classic and it is comes in a cloth bound edition, I get the cloth bound as a little treat to myself for lo falling in love with a with new classic. These cloth bounds are of course designed by the incredibly talented Quirly Bickford Smith who I am just the biggest fan of and it's absolutely beautiful. So on the cover we have Don Quixote holding up a shield and a chivalry novel because the story of Don Quixote is this man, not really Don Quixote, his name is Alonso Quijana, and he read so many chivalry novels that they basically drove him to, into madness, kind of madness, quote-unquote madness, and he thinks that he is a knight errant, and he goes to basically better the world and to fight evil and to do good, essentially. Save, um, save damsels in distress and whatnot. He has a wonderful sidekick and squire and best friend Sancho Panza who I love so much. It's just such an incredible book. It's such an incredible story and I had to have it in cloth bound. Um, also, what I love is that sometimes depending on, I think, I don't know if all of them have it, but some of the cloth bounds have a little piece of paper that wraps around the, like one of the covers and it tells you a little bit more about the um, like the different books that they have in the cloth bounds and this one had the little design of Don Quixote holding up the chivalry novel with a quote and the quote says for me alone was Don Quixote born and I for him it was for him to act for me to write and that is a, a quote from Miguel de Cervantes and it was so it's so beautiful that I cut it and I think I'm going to keep it in the book forever and kind of use it as a bookmark. Um, I don't usually read my cloth bounds because I like them to stay in pristine condition. That's why whenever, like I read the book in a different edition and if I love it, then I'll get the special edition that I won't touch. It's really just a, a collector's item. Um, so it's so beautiful and I'm so happy that I have to add it to my collection. I have no more room left like this way. I have my cloth bands lined up this way so I'm gonna have to put it on top for now and do some rearranging for my on my bookshelf but I don't have time right now because I really have to work on my oops, on my senior thesis project so for now I am going to scan this in and work on that 
Hopefully later I'll have time to read War and Peace. I haven't had time the past two days. The day before Easter I read about like 10 pages, which is just so sad because all I want to do is read War and Peace and I just don't have time. But I'm going to make time. It is going to happen. This has been my most like strenuous project ever. I don't know, ever, maybe ever. I'm not too sure. <laughs> um, I have to think back to my other projects. But I'm so happy with how it's coming out. And I feel like once this project is done, I'm going to have a bit more time. Just because my heart and soul has been dedicated into that embroidery project. So yes, I will definitely um, keep you guys updated with my reading. Of course, that's what this vlog is all about. And I hope you guys are having a great day so far. And I hope you liked this little unboxing update. Um, so I will talk to you guys very soon. And again, Christelle, thank you so much. Give you a big hug. And uh, I don't know, actually, did you put your address on here? You did. I'm going to send you a little thank you. <laughs> I love sending you guys thank you cards. So, yes, thank you so, so, so much. Um, and I will talk to you guys very soon. Hello everybody, it is now Sunday, April 11th, and I have been actually filming this whole time throughout the past days. It isn't a time jump, I promise, but this vlog is already getting pretty long. I was editing it, and it's already at almost an hour, so I thought I'm going to split up this vlog a bit. I did mention earlier when I was opening up my new Emma Penguin Threads edition that I was going to rearrange my bookshelves, and as you can see, a bit... Here he is, I made room for Don Quixote, but I did film myself rearranging my bookshelves, so I was going to include it in this vlog, but this vlog's already pretty long, so I thought I would break it up, split it in half, and just create many reading vlogs for War and Peace. Last night I reached part three of book one, so right now I am on chapter three of part three, book one, and I am on page 228, so I am really making my way through, absolutely adoring it. I have so much to say about the book, but I will talk more about it in my next reading vlog where I reorganize my bookshelves as well. But I thought that this vlog would be a nice beginning of reading War and Peace. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed watching me start War and Peace. I am just head over heels in love with it, and there is so much that I want to say, but I will save that for my next reading vlog, and I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful day. I will see you soon in another War and Peace reading vlog, or a sit-down video if I have time to film them, but uni is crazy, so that might not happen. Anyway, I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful day. I will see you soon in another video. Happy reading.